Thank you very much, first of all, the organizers uh, for this kind invitation, and it's a great pleasure to be here. So, as I said, like my name is Alena Shkumatova, and I um, work at the Institute Curie in Paris. And so, we are switching now the gears, and I will be talking about uh, non-coding RNAs, in particular, long non-coding RNAs. And the first question, of course, is why are we interested in, at all in studying non-coding genome, non-coding um, RNAs. And probably most of you know that uh, only 1% of the uh, human genome encodes for uh, protein coding exons. Only 1%. Uh, around 40% of the human genome encode for uh, introns, and most of these introns contribute to protein coding genes, right? They are coming from these um, transcripts. Um, the majority of the human genome is uh, so-called intergenic, but the interesting part about this intergenic region is that, um, oops, sorry, that uh, around 43% of variations in genome-wide association studies we have found in these intergenic regions, indicating that they might be interesting and something interesting is going on there, they might be associated with diseases and so on. And also the interesting part of it is that um, around 60% of so-called intergenic regions are transcribed. And this is the phenomenon which is called pervasive transcription. So now, even with a very conservative estimation of uh, um, uh, ENCO, uh, ENCODE data, uh, we know that approximately 70% of the human genome is transcribed. So the question is, what are all these like transcripts which are not coding for proteins? And uh, a lot of them are uh, the non-coding RNAs. So um, I tried to classify the, mm, summarize the non-coding RNA world into different classes here based uh, strictly on their size. However, their functions and their biogenesis, how they are processed and so on are very different. So one probably of the best studied and uh, most homogeneous classes of non-coding RNAs are small non-coding RNAs. They are um, including microRNAs, pyRNAs, and siRNAs. They will be mentioned during this course um, uh, later on. Then there are intermediate non-coding, and it's small non-coding RNAs are probably the most uh, consistent and most um, uh, uniform class of uh, RNAs because they have also a very particular biogenesis pathway, how they are processed, and very distinct size and functions. So intermediate non-coding RNAs includes no RNAs, tRNAs, US, and uh, uh, SN RNAs. And finally, we have this class of very, very heterogeneous class of uh, molecules called long non-coding RNAs. And here we have to include also ribosomal RNAs in this class. However, when people are talking today about uh, long non-coding RNAs, usually they mean um, uh, either long intervening or intergenic non-coding RNAs, or antisensor RNAs and also circle RNAs. So, as I said, like antisense RNAs, that would be the situation like this. Here is your protein coding gene. The antisense uh, long non coding RNA would be going in the antisense direction uh, compared to the non coding gene, uh, coding gene. You can imagine this situation that uh, these long non coding RNAs are uh, transcribed within the intron of protein coding gene. And there are these cases when uh, non coding, long non coding RNAs, are really between uh, two different transcripts. They are transcribed as independent units. They are not overlapping with any other known genes. And uh, those RNAs are called uh, intervening or intergenic. So, um, yes. So, I will, I will um, um, describe today how we define long non-coding RNAs, how they are found and uh, in the in different genomes. Um, We'll talk about uh, link RNA functions and um, functions, whether there are some functions, because it's a big discussion in the field, which is noise, just transcriptional noise, and what has uh, functional relevance. Um, about molecular mechanisms, and really, really briefly, we'll touch the evolution of long non coding RNAs. So, long non coding RNAs have been studied for a while. Um, one of the most probably famous uh, long non coding RNAs is um, a long non coding RNA called EXIST. Um, this uh, long non-coding RNA has been discovered in 1991, so it has been on the market for a while, and it's one of the most famous um, uh, link RNAs because it is absolutely 
uh, necessary for the dosage compensation in mammals. So uh, uh, females have two X chromosomes and one has to be uh, inactivated and uh, exist regulating this process, absolutely required for this. However, the field of long non-coding RNA is exploded a while ago, um, approximately 2009. Uh, once people have realized that there are a lot of, a lot of these long non-coding transcripts in our genome, actually thousands, and uh, the discovery of these long non-coding RNAs uh, was based on uh, the presence of chromatin modification marks, people uh, call them chromatin signature maps, which revealed that uh, there are transcripts. So um, here people have looked at uh, K4 methylation, which is associated with act, um, actively transcribed uh, transcriptional star sites, sorry, uh, promoters, and H3K37 um, methylation, which is associated with active elongation. And here there are two uh, protein coding genes, and people realize that there are these islands, these maps of active transcription going on between, tr uh, between um, coding genes. So that led to the discovery of thousands of these uh, long non-coding RNAs in human genome. And from this point, people started looking at all possible tissues and cell lines and organisms to look whether uh, these transcripts are present in um, other uh, genomes, basically. So uh, a while ago, we identified long non-coding RNAs in zebrafish, which is a very distant vertebrate species, is separated uh, from humans by 450 million years of evolution. And you might ask, what, well, why, why looking for these long non-coding RNAs in such a distant basal vertebrate? But it turned out we can learn actually a lot uh, from looking at zebrafish genome about the uh, evolution and functions of mammalian long non-coding RNAs. But first we had to discover this long non-coding RNAs in zebrafish, and that's how we did it. So here you are looking at the, kind of like, like imagine that's a genome, and zebrafish genome. And first of all, we map the three prime ends of all active tran uh, actively transcribed genes uh, by a technique which is called 3P-seq, um, developed in David Bartel's lab. And what we found is that the majority of uh, poly-A tags we are mapping precisely to the coding genes ends or alternative polyadenylation sites, but some of them we are like in between these coding, uh, coding genes. Then we looked at the actively transcribed promoters by uh, looking again like uh, people have done in uh, humans, um, uh, looking at H3K4-3 methylation chromatin maps. And again, we found the majority of, of these chromatin modification marks around non-coding genes but some of them, we are some, some we are in the gene desert. Well, then you have now a frame, basically. You can imagine, so coding genes, right? And that's kind of like, looks already like a transcriptional unit. And you can fill out this transcriptional, uh, transcription units uh, by uh, looking at the RNA-seq data and um, ESTs, spliced ESTs. And so we were able to identify these regions uh, of a transcription which we are not associated with any non-protein coding genes or any uh, non-coding uh, non small, for example, non-coding RNAs. I will tell you uh, afterwards how we filter out because, of course, the next question would be how do you know that these transcripts are non-coding, right? So today, I guess, uh, most people use this combination of, if they have this data, most uh, this combination of data sets to annotate uh, novel uh, long non-coding RNAs, such as active transcription by H3K3 uh, methylation, uh, uh, elongation by H3K36 uh, methylation. Cage data would really precisely ma map the five prime end uh, of the transcript, any transcript, protein coding, non-coding. Uh, 3P seq data, as I mentioned before, maps precisely the poly A tags, uh, poly A um, ends, and RNA seq data, of course, to uh, ma map and construct these uh, um, uh, non coding transcripts. So, but again, the question once you, you have this kind of like library of um, potentially non coding transcripts, the question becomes how do you distinguish between uh, how do you know that they are non-coding, right? They might be uh, some not annotated coding genes. And so people have applied several methods, mostly first computationally methods, how to filter out that these uh, 
identified genes are non-coding. And of course, these methods, like there are algorithms looking for uh, bigger ORFs. Once you found this uh, in your putative non-coding transcript, a big ORF, you will uh, look at the sequence and compare the sequence to the other databases, protein databases, and see whether there is any similarity to any known uh, protein databases or even the uh, domains, protein domains, because then it would be a good indication that probably the transcript you are dealing with is a protein coding transcript. So you can filter out a lot of stuff, so you end up uh, with a set of genes uh, which is kind of like high confidence. Um, uh, you're confident that they are non-coding. Another way, way uh, experimental way um, to distinguish between protein coding and non-coding transcripts, long non-coding transcripts, um, is uh, to look at the riboseq data, so or ribosome profiling data. So it's an experimental way to look genome-wide where the translating ribosome uh, is by looking at the ribosome-protected fragments. And you can imagine that for protein coding genes, that would look like this, the ribosome profiling data, sorry, that's RNA-seq, this is ribosome profiling data. So you can see that it's a definitely translated uh, transcript, while for um, long term coding RNA, such as this example, you can see that uh, if you see a ribosome profiling data, it's very, very sparse, uh, very often uh, restricted to very short ORF, which wouldn't encode a, a functional peptide. So using this ribosome profiling data, you can clean up your data sets and uh, organize and, and, and say, at least genome-wide, that, for example, here uh, in this study, they used ribosome profiling data in three uh, data sets, two coming from zebrafish, one from mouse ES cells, and could distinguish that actually uh, looking at the ribosome profiling that a couple of uh, or substantial fraction of um, previously identified non-coding uh, transcripts to be a coding action. So to summarize this part, today what we call uh, long non-coding RNAs are transcripts which are larger than 200 nucleotides, typically they are spliced. Uh, they are transcribed by Pol2, so mean, meaning they are capped and polyadenylated, and that's why it's so hard to distinguish them uh, from, from uh, protein coding genes, right? Because at the biogenesis level, they are indistinguishable uh, from protein coding genes. And as I mentioned before, thousands of long non coding RNAs have been uh, identified in mammals, and uh, I guess the list of uh, new non coding RNAs is growing and growing. Every month, there is another tissue or cell type where you find uh, another set of uh, non coding RNAs. And long non coding RNAs have been identified in many other. Uh, organisms besides of mammals, including frog, zebrafish, fly, nematode, uh, plants, and so on and so on. You name it. So, the big question, of course, like once uh, we saw all these thousand transcripts in, in our genome and other genomes, is uh, do these transcripts have any function? Based on a very few studied examples uh, from previous studies, we know that, yeah, they might have. But really, thousands of molecules, which we kind of like haven't noticed that they exist in our genome. So how do we uh, how do we know whether they are functional, right? So um, people started arguing that uh, long non coding RNA transcripts uh, must be functional due to the fact that they're tissue specifically expressed, like. Um, here you can see a mouse brain sections and a couple of uh, long non-coding RNAs uh, expressed in very particular uh, brain uh, regions, highly enriched in brain. We also looked in zebrafish at a couple of long non-coding RNAs and also saw the same picture. They are uh, uh, very tissue specific. In some cases, they are expressed in really uh, particular, very tiny subpopulations of neurons. Another argument for uh, that long non coding RNA is, um, must be functional is that they respond to different stimuli, such as um, a lot of long non coding RNAs have been associated um, via up or down regulated in uh, multiple cancers, like uh, has been shown in this study. Or, for example, um, another collaborative. Uh, uh, correlative study showed that a long non-coding RNA uh, called hot air 
is associated with a very poor surviving prognosis if overexpressed in uh, primary breast tumor uh, tumors. So basically, you have uh, worse chances to survive if uh, this hot air is um, overexpressed. Sorry, that's this graph. <coughs> so um, again. Uh, that, that was this point, that dysregulation in human diseases, including cancers in neurological disorders, led people to believe that, well, most of them uh, should be and must be functional. So, and uh, there is a growing repertoire of cellular processes where link RNAs play key roles. Uh, most of them uh, we have been um, studied in different cell lines, um, but here is a very, very short list Literally every month there is, every week almost, there is another paper showing a long non-coding transcript uh, associated or involved in uh, this and this function. Some of them are like exist, are known for a while or um, uh, error. Uh, some of them are relatively new, like NEAT1, uh, well, no, NEAT1 was studied already for a while, Fender and so on. So a lot of them have been shown to be associated with some type of cellular functions. However, uh, functions at the organismal level, uh, we are still lacking and, and we are still behind this. So in cells, people started uh, looking at the functions of the long non-coding RNAs by uh, perturbing them, uh, their expression, either by knockdown uh, by siRNAs or shRNAs uh, of single genes in cell lines or doing some kind of like screens uh, a uh, high throughput uh, link RNA loss of function by RNA interference, uh, like in this study, so uh, infecting um, uh, your favorite cells of interest, like embryonic stem cells with shRNA libraries, and searching for uh, a loss of function, for example, differentiation and so on of uh, ES cells. So, but finally, because of CRISPR-Cas9 technology, which was already mentioned before here, uh, people started moving to the, from uh, knockdown assays to knockout assays. And uh, uh, several knockout mice were published recently, such as MALAT1, NEAT1, Fender, Hot Air, and another 20 knockouts. Um, yeah, using, as I said, like TELINS or uh, CRISPR-Cas9, in in also in mammalian cell lines, not only uh, organisms. Uh, in my lab, we are using uh, ZebraFish as a model system to uh, investigate functions of long non-coding RNAs, as I mentioned before. And we are also doing uh, link RNA perturbations by uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 and evaluating the phenotype. Is there any visible phenotype? Is there any morphology defects or uh, uh, any, any, any morphology defects and so on? And as I said, like using ZebraFish, um, has its advantages because it has actually, in contrast to mammals, rapid and external fertilization. So you can follow the development uh, from a single cell under the microscope. And um, we have genetic tools like uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and the complete genome is available. So that makes it to advantage. But the, uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 technology to knock out uh, or perturb functions of long non-coding RNAs is not that trivial. And because it's a course, I, I wanted to mention that, you know, so introducing a mutation in a protein coding gene is relatively uh, uh, easy. You can, you can introduce a frame shift or a stop codon. Um, however, for long non-coding RNAs, introducing a point mutation wouldn't work it will be still functional because there is no ORF, there is no stop codon, right? So you can imagine different scenarios how to knock, uh, how to achieve a um, knockout situation for a long non-coding RNA. Of course, you can uh, just delete the whole transcript, you know, big deletion, and uh, look what happens. However, very often these transcripts span really multiple, multiple of KBs, and um, it's very hard uh, to predict if you're deleting a big chunk of DNA, whether you're not affecting uh, any DNA regulatory motifs, right? Enhancers, for example, so that your phenotype will be coming from the RNA from the transcript and not from uh, affecting uh, DNA motifs. You can imagine a scenario where you just delete TSS and that would be a smaller deletion and uh, hope for the loss of function of a long non-coding RNA. 
However, in our hands, we introduced uh, several, we made several uh, fish lines actually, uh, which had TSS deletions. And what happens that the caveat of this technology is that uh, long term coding RNAs start using an alternative TSS or a cryptic promoter. So, also not an ideal situation, maybe. So, what you also can do is to introduce a premature uh, poly A uh, signal to stop the transcription quite early. So, you know, like you try to introduce the, this premature uh, uh, poly A tail, poly A signal. However, in several cases, it has been shown that the polymerase can still uh, read through and it uh, still goes, um, you know, you get some, some, some transcription going on. Um, recently, uh, we, we are thinking about introducing a, a very short uh, therapy, H-nucleotide nucleotide therapy, um, ribozyme, self-cleaving ribozyme, which has been mentioned uh, here in this course already also. So you can imagine that the transcription happens, but then the transcript is uh, uh, actively and efficiently degraded by this uh, small hairpin. So it's least, uh, less, in, uh, less invasive um, uh, gene editing than, uh, for example, this one. So we are kind of like, oh yeah, and you can also imagine introducing a reported gene into the locus without uh, deleting actually the long non-coding RNA transcript or affecting any um, DNA. Uh, DNA uh, regulatory motifs. However, here you can also imagine that eventually you will perturb the three-dimensional structure of the genome. So, taking together, there are different ways to uh, interfere with the functions of long non coding RNAs, and one should be careful creating and designing uh, how to knock them out, uh, because that it might the interpretation of the phenotype might be uh, quite difficult. Is it coming from the, the, uh, the, the, the phenotype coming from the fact of transcription or from the, uh, from the transcript or from DNA motifs, right? So I wanted to mention a couple of studies which used actually um, knockouts and uh, with our, the analysis of this uh, long non-coding RNA transcript knockouts uh, showed that, for example, for example, this is a transcript called Fender. Um, this knockout was, it's not a knockout, it's actually here in this case, a premature poly A uh, was introduced quite early in, in the transcript. And I think they introduced actually three, yeah, three times poly A, because otherwise the polymerase would read through a, again, um, uh, leading to a not very efficient uh, uh, um, stop of the transcription. And uh, Fender is one of our favorite examples because, uh, first of all, it has a very um, severe developmental uh, phenotype. So uh, loss of Fender causes embryo lethality in mice and defects in multiple organs like heart and lung. Uh, but also in this, in this paper, they were actually uh, able to rescue this phenotype by introducing, knocking in the long non-coding RNA transcript. So meaning that the phenotype really coming from the uh, transcript um, and not some kind of like affecting DNA regulatory motifs. Another example I wanted to mention as, as a functional long non-coding RNA is a NEAT1 mouse knockout. This um, long non-coding RNA has a long history in terms of it's one of the very abundant um, uh, non-coding non -coding RNAs and the knockouts uh, it kind of like gave a headache first the researchers because in cell culture people have seen that uh, need one is uh, required for paraspecal formation and so on so some kind of like cellular phenotype was uh, observed in cell lines however uh, mice were viable and there was no detec detectable uh, defect in, in um, uh, uh, knockout mice however people have noticed that um, the babies of uh, uh, coming from um, a knockout, need one knockout mice, they have severe developmental, not the severe developmental uh, defects, but they, are, they grow slower. Sometimes they die. And it turned out they die not because they have developmental defects, but because moms have uh, a problem with lactation. 
so it turned out that loss of NEAT1 results in aberrant memory gland morphogenesis and lactation defects. You might think so like it's not a very um, strong defect. However, if you think about third world countries, it might be a very uh, uh, essential uh, defect. And yeah, and if you put these babies, these babies, uh, knockout babies, just to regular wild type moms, they develop absolutely normally. So um, that's a very nice uh, phenotype. So just to summarize this part, there is a vast number of uh, long encoding RNAs in vertebrate genomes with putative regulatory potential, and only a selected few have been explored and have demonstrated functions so far. And um, you know, people started using more and more uh, genetic toolkits of model organisms, and, and, and it can be used and should be used uh, for discovery of long non-coding RNA functions. So once you have the function, so you identified lo your long non-coding RNAs, you got your function by some loss of function assay. Um, the question is, uh, what do they do in the cell? How do they act? And uh, here we are switching to the molecular mechanisms of action of long non-coding RNAs. And long non-coding RNAs, uh, they are localized in different domains. Um, they are the best studies, some of the best studies examples like EXIST, MALAT1, NEAT1, uh, almost exclusively uh, localized in the nucleus. However, the majority of long non-coding RNAs spend most of their time in the cytoplasm. So if you look at the uh, fractionations, uh, fractions uh, here, uh, so mRNAs are mostly uh, uh, cytoplasmic, and here are link RNAs, and so link RNAs uh, most, uh, most of the time spend their time in the uh, cytoplasm, in the cytosol. So what, what are the mechanisms of link RNA action, generally speaking? Um, like any RNAs, long term coding RNAs are highly decorated with proteins, right? In all proposed models so far, uh, long term coding RNAs don't act on their own per se, in, mo in, in the majority of cases, but really are decorated and associated with proteins. And so um, the best, I guess, the most established um, view on long non-coding RNAs is, uh, which are nuclear, nuclear long non-coding RNAs, that they are associated with chromatin. Um, there are different models that have been proposed. Uh, one of them is that long non-coding RNAs associated with chromatin uh, modification complexes and somehow magically uh, drag these uh, chromatin modification complexes to the uh, sites of, uh, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, targets where they activate or repress protein gene expression. Another model, um, kind of like similar but complementary model, um, suggests that long term coding RNAs might act as scaffolds. So bringing together components which are kind of like in the cell would be independently acting, but they keep them together and that forms a dynamic protein uh, RNA complex. So, So several studies have uh, shown that um, really there is a variety of uh, chromatin modifiers uh, which are, or, or link RNAs which are associated with chromatin modification complexes. So basically what people have done are pull downs on each component of chrom chromatin modification complexes and sequenced uh, uh, link RNAs associated with them. However, uh, it has been also kind of like question if it's true, if this model is true, because it turned out that RNA binding proteins like polycomp uh, are very promiscuous and might be binding on this long non-coding RNA just, just because they are abundant and uh, uh, because of this uh, promiscuous binding. So um, kind of like reading these papers, keep it in mind that uh, RNA binding proteins, especially in uh, pull downs, they might be binding on um, RNAs of interest, such as link RNAs, uh, quite uh, A-specifically. So another, another model has been proposed that long non-coding RNA uh, s uh, might be associated in the three-dimensional organization of the genome. Uh, basically, uh, what happens in the genome, obviously the D DNA is not, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, stride and, and planner, but uh, it has a lot of loops. And uh, it has been suggested that uh, long non-coding RNAs uh, might be helping kind of like uh, for, for this um, uh, DNA looping, like this example of hot tip. So as I said, so like nuclear long non-coding RNAs have been uh, shown to be uh, involved either with chromatin modification complexes or uh, contributing to high order chromatin interactions. Um, however, the majority of long non coding RNAs end up in cytoplasm. And there, uh, as I said, so like also in all proposed models so far, they're interacting with some uh, proteins. Uh, they act, have been suggested to act as mo molecular decoys, uh, pairing with other RNAs or being cytoplasmic uh, scaffolds. So, so far, uh, little is known about the biological roles of link RNAs and even less about uh, how they carry out their functions in the cell. So it's a quite new field of long non-coding RNAs. And uh, as I said, like in the summary, we can summarize basically as a common theme for nuclear long non-coding RNAs that they are associated with chromatin. For cytoplasm, um, no obvious uniting theme is uh, found yet, at least. And maybe uh, it it's also will be not found, because actually we are throwing in a big pot of uh, called long non-coding RNAs, all possible transcripts with all possible flavors. And who knows uh, whether there are any different classes of them and so on. But however, uh, if we look at the, uh, at the proteins associated with this long non-coding RNAs, it might be uh, helpful and we will be able to classify them and put them in into different classes. And as I said, like, yeah, protein, protein assemblies um, are important. And this is one of the limiting factors, uh, uh, steps as well, experimentally limiting, because so far people have used mostly RNA pull downs, either with endogenous or exogenous RNAs, uh, pulled uh, these RNAs and uh, a mass uh, uh, identified proteins binding to these RNAs by mass spectrometry, um, which is kind of like a very nice approach, but often you get very abundant, very sticky RNA binding proteins in these pull downs. So we really need uh, new technology and uh, new approaches how to identify RNA binding proteins. So I will uh, very briefly uh, touch the evolution of link non, uh, uh, long non coding RNAs because it's actually very fascinating. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, my lab is interested in, or, or the major organism we are using for the functional discovery of long non coding RNAs is zebrafish. And I mentioned before that zebrafish is a quite distant vertebrate species uh, separated from us by 450, approximately 450 million years. It turned out it's very useful actually to look so far away in the evolution because it turned out, so as we identified the long non-coding RNAs in zebrafish, obviously the question was, are there any, is there any similarity to mammalian long non-coding RNAs? And it turned out that only 5%, 29 out of 597, which we identified in the original study, were conserved at the sequence level to um, mammals. So they are really poorly conserved uh, uh, transcripts. And usually this sequence conservation was restricted to uh, small, uh, short regions of, of um, uh, sequence similarity, usually between 50, uh, 50 and 300 nucleotides. So here is one of the examples. Um, you can see this uh, fragment of 300 nucleotides embedded in this long, non-conserved transcript. So usually if you see a sequence conservation, it's very patchy. However, if it's conserved to zebrafish, from zebrafish to mammals, there is a good indication that this uh, sequence might be functional or associated with some um, uh, RNA binding proteins eventually uh, because there is so much pressure on, 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 on this sequ sequence while the rest stays um, non-conserved. When we looked, so at the sequence level, we didn't see so much, uh, um, so much conservation. However, when we looked at the genomic position of long non-coding RNAs, it turned out that they are much more often than you would expect by chance of a protein coding gene um, allocated in the same position. So here is again a genome 
um, uh, it's, it's a, a snapshot, so here is a protein coding gene, and here is the long known coding RNA. And you can find the same, well, the same, we, we call it the same, but it's, it might be not the same. It's the same uh, in terms of the positional conservation, non coding transcript in close proximity to this gene. And we saw it actually for a lot of genes. Um, uh, 263 out of uh, 567 link RNAs um, had mammalian counterpart in a matching genomic position. So it's a phenomenon called syntony. And not only they, we are sitting in the same genomic positions, but also a significant fr fraction of synthetic link RNAs maintain the same orientation, transcriptional orientation, like in this case, right? It's transcribed in the same direction. So. It seems that um, there is not so much evolutionary pressure on the sequences, but there is some uh, evolutionary pressure on maintaining non-coding transcripts. We don't know whether they are true or orthologous transcripts or not because there is no sequence conservation in certain genomic positions. And usually these positions are associated with uh, genes which are involved in development, uh, developmentally important genes, and so on. So it seems that the positional conservation is more widespread than sequence conservation, which is sparse in, uh, and restricted to short regions. So that raises also the question, how do new uh, long term coding RNAs uh, originate? And you can imagine several scenarios, like uh, de novo formation from previously untranscribed genomic sequence. It's quite a rare case because uh, we don't see it so often. You can uh, imagine a duplication and divergence uh, of another long non coding RNA. Or you can imagine another scenario like transformation of a protein coding gene. And that's a very interesting example for EXIST, which was originally a protein coding gene, uh, and then this whole evolution to pseudogene and to non coding functional non coding RNA. Interestingly, people raised also this possibility that um, link RNAs might, uh, may serve as a burst pool for protein coding genes. And uh, one of the studies uh, have shown that there are, um, this study, that there are, uh, the study identified 24 motherless proteins. So motherless proteins are those proteins which we are not, uh, th 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 their um, uh, origin for this protein wasn't found in any other species. So they are kind of like came from nowhere. And people were wondering, um, it doesn't happen very often. There are very few of them in our genome. So usually if it's a protein coding gene, we always can trace back in the evolution how, how it originated. And so there were these um, motherless proteins in our human genome, and people were wondering where they came from. And it turned out that uh, for 24 of them, uh, people uh, could track them uh, to the origin of non-coding RNAs in rhesus macaque and chimpanzee. So they have similar transcript structure and tissue expression profile, but protein coding genes uh, gained a higher transcriptional abundance after, uh, during the evolution. So um, in summary, um, link RNAs exhibit more positional conservation than sequence conservation, and link RNAs are genes which are born or die during evolution much faster than protein coding genes. So it's, it's kind of like really you can uh, think about a long term coding RNA as a uh, burst pool uh, of new biological functions. Uh, because uh, RNA molecule is a fine, cool molecule to try new functions, right? You, if you introduce some mutations there, probably the consequences will be not that dramatic as for protein coding genes. So it's, 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 it's a great substrate to try new th things. And I guess we will be uh, hearing about it uh, during this course more about the evolution of um, uh, RNA. So um, just, just to conclude this part, very general introduction in the long non-coding RNA field. Um, tomorrow I will tell you a little bit more what we are doing in practice to kind of like uh, dissect their functions and mechanisms of action and how we think about, um, you know, we identify thousands of link RNA genes uh, in the genome. So how do you start like looking at their function? What, what, what's the criterion? How do you look at your favorite molecule? How do you choose your favorite molecule? Um, 
few uh, well-studied examples suggest that several link RNAs might play important roles in diverse uh, biological uh, processes. And uh, as I said, so like before, long non coding RNA exhibit more positional conservation this than sequence conservation. It's a phenomenon which we still don't understand. And there are several explanations which might lead us to like what's happening there, but uh, again, we have no explanation so far, uh, coherent explanation so far. And uh, what's definitely needed in the, uh, as I said before, long non coding RNA is um, a very young field, and what's needed in the field are tools for long non coding RNA function discovery. Um, it's relatively tricky, as I mentioned before. It's not that easy to knock out a long non-coding RNA and be sure that uh, the phenotype you're observing is coming really from the RNA. Um, well, we need uh, comparative genomics. Looking in different distant species at the long non-coding RNAs might help us to characterize them better, their um, origin, evolution, and functions, eventually functions, and maybe group them in different classes. And um, as I mentioned before, also looking at the interaction partners of different long non coding RNAs might help us to understand how and <coughs> what they are doing in the cell. And for this, we need uh, better approaches to um, identify um, uh, protein interaction partners for long non coding RNAs. And so more about long non coding RNAs and their functions and mechanisms of action tomorrow then. Thank you very much.